CPA and a full-time author, and he's got <clears throat> about 10 books <laughs> under his belt. <laughs> Not, not quite 10, Dominic. Uh, we just published number six and working on number seven and eight. So it's, it's okay. they're steadily coming along. Complimenti. Uh, it's, um, it's nice to uh, hear that you're continuing and um, putting out books. The latest book is uh, The Rook Takes the Queen. And uh, I don't have to ask you where you get your material. Uh, you uh, rip them from the headlines in Chicago. Yeah, this is a this is a political thriller, which is different from the other books that I've uh, written. Most other, all my other thrillers have been uh, uh, based in Chicago, uh, the Vatican. Uh, two books ago was based, well, the last book before this one was based out of Detroit, and this one is uh, right out of the headlines from last summer. And it starts out with uh, the mayor of Chicago being assassinated in the backyard. And there, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, commotion about as far as the detectives and people trying to find out who, uh, who assassinated the mayor. And um, it's, um, it's pretty much... It's uh, pretty much a political thriller, and we're, the reason why I, I came up with the name when the Rook Takes the Queen is that we have uh, one of the characters, a, a former Grand Master who is now a Catholic priest. He is a political activist, and his name is Father Colin J. Fitzgerald, and he starts a weekly gambit with the organized crime boss, Anthony Tony de Mateo. And the whole reason how this all gets started is uh, the priest suggests at the uh, funeral of uh, Tony DiMatteo's mother that uh, he come into the rectory and start playing chess with them on a weekly basis. So uh, that's how it all gets started. And of course, he suggests to uh, little Tony that the city of Chicago was run much better when the outfit was in charge 30 and 40 years ago. And he suggests that uh, little Tony take more of an active role in keeping peace in the city. Of course, the Chicago Tribune reporter Larry McKay is uh, trying to find out who you know, is responsible for the assassinating the mayor and how all this new violence has come about and how uh, the relationship between uh, Father Fitz and uh, Little Tony is related. So that's how it all gets started. Uh, how have you gotten any? Re, uh, response from uh, uh, the city of Chicago or, or uh, some no, of the no, all the names have been changed, of course. Um, What's that? All of the names have been changed, of course. Um, but it's, uh, it's, I mean, it is a controversial storyline, but um, basically, uh, it, it just addresses a lot, of, you know, a fictional what if, what if. Uh, Things, you know, totally get out of hand as far as the city of Chicago is concerned. Um, it's, uh, it's a fictitious story based on, um, you know, things with Chicago being completely and totally out of control. Uh, how, how does uh, your Italian background uh, impact on how you portray Italian Americans in, in your book? Um, well... Here's the thing, I, my protagonists have always been at least half Italian, if not all Italian, and I've had some antagonists um, who have had some uh, organized uh, crime backgrounds as being the antagonists, but there are a lot of um, people in my book that, in my books that, that do have Italian backgrounds, and uh, my prior book, um, it's when, uh, Juan de Dormo is about a, uh, an obstetrician who uh, has a sleepwalking issue and happens to be pro-life. His name is Dr. David Fazio. And he basically um, has these sleepwalking issues. He wakes up one morning with his hands all burned and then realizes that the, uh, uh, the, uh, the arson, there's an arsonist out there burning down these uh, family planning clinics um, around the city. And 
so he's being investigated by the uh, city of Chicago and uh, um, he's being under suspicion of having started these fires and that's how the whole um, storyline goes with that one but um, all my characters have some Italian background whether they're protagonists or antagonists so it's not like I'm making one type of character um, strictly Italian or non-Italian You're you're from Detroit, right? Correct. Uh, as I uh, been in this business for uh, forty some years, maybe more, but I don't know much about the Detroit Italian community. It's a very strong, very traditional community, and I think the reason why Detroit has had an advantage over a lot of other Italian uh, communities in the sense that Detroit is right next door to Windsor. And Windsor has a very strong Italian uh, uh, area there. That, um, I don't know if you've heard of, uh, uh, of their little Italy, which is uh, right off of uh, the bridge there in uh, Windsor. And it's, it's, it's so Italian, as a matter of fact, that there's all the street signs are in Italian. And everyone basically speaks Italian on the streets and so forth. And they have a lot of strong Italian memberships strong Italian contingent there in uh, Windsor, which of course has spilled over to Detroit for years. Um, back in the uh, uh, days of prohibition, one of the biggest points of, uh, of the bootlegging industry came from Windsor and the Italian and so forth, uh, you know, smuggling their, uh, their, their liquor over the Detroit River over to Detroit. There's another uh, popular area near the Eastern Market in Detroit, which they call Cavalupo. And what Cavalupo basically means is there's maybe 200 or 300 houses which in a particular area of Detroit that basically have caves going from house to house. And these caves were used anytime somebody's house got raided over prohibition looking for uh, bootleg liquor uh, and so forth. So, there is a lot of Italian history in Detroit, and uh, there still is a very strong Italian contingent there. I don't know what's happening, but I'm, I'm having voice issues here. Yeah. Uh, I think the uh, the Windsor um, case uh, illustrates the fact that uh, Canada, as a nation, has had a different policy toward immigrants over the long haul uh, than the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Uh, the idea was always to Americanize. Maybe up into the 1970s, uh, did. Uh, 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 we think in terms of our ethnic identity uh, uh, so heavily. Um, but in Canada, the Italian language was encouraged in the schools. And uh, uh, it, in a way, I think uh, the English portion of Canada liked to encourage the other smaller minorities uh, like the Italians and, and others uh, to have some uh, power and some recognition to balance off the French uh, influence in Canadian affairs. But uh, in any case, uh, Canadians, uh, Canadian Italians seem to be much more attached to the language and to the culture uh, than Americans. But the Americans started earlier and so maybe it's rubbing off, uh, the uh, Italian identity is rubbing off at, at this point. And in Canada, it will eventually rub off as well, but. Uh, this is a very strong Italian contingent in, in Windsor, especially, and um, there was always a very strong Italian contingent in Toronto. Um, although I've heard that's uh, somewhat uh, gone down in the last 
Yeah. There's a very strong Italian. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your education and maybe you're growing up in the, uh, did you grow up in an Italian neighborhood? Yes, I did. I grew up in an Italian neighborhood in, in uh, Italian suburbs. I went to a parochial high school where we would say about 70% of our classmates were all basically Italian. Um, I learned the Italian language from my grandparents, uh, even though I'm first generation. Um, I spent a lot of weekends with my grandparents and learned the language and the culture from them and of course from my parents as well. And um, just being from a, a, a first generation uh, Italian family, my father was a bricklayer and I started laying brick with my father when he was 14, when I was 14, excuse me. And then uh, went on to, uh, to college, went to Central Michigan University, graduated from there with a common degree. And uh, I moved to Chicago and took a chance and uh, that started here in Chicago. I eventually opened up my own accounting firm. And uh, what brought you to write your first book? I know that you were uh, encouraged by your high school uh, teachers uh, to develop that talent, but uh, when did you, what's the career of your writing? What's the first thing you sold or whatever? Well, I, uh, I was a very talented writer in high school. I was encouraged by all my English teachers to pursue it after uh, going to high school there. And one of my English teachers basically said, if you do anything else with your life, you're pretty much wasting your time. And um, I guess I just wasn't convinced that there was a future in, in writing back then. And um, my, I didn't get any encouragement from my parents because... They didn't see where, you know, how to make a buck as far as writing or going into journalism is concerned. They didn't really see that as being a, uh, a strong suit as far as, you know, a responsible career for myself. So uh, I eventually became an accountant and I didn't think about writing anymore. Um, I think my writing came back within the last six or seven years. I had some personal problems and uh, uh, eventually got divorced and, um, I was uh, doing some therapy with a very dear therapist who basically suggested, said, hey, why don't you go back and, you know, pick up the pen again and start writing, see, uh, see how it goes for them. And uh, I started taking some creative writing courses at uh, the College of DuPage, and I just realized I really enjoyed it. And now it's, it's become a passion for me. I, mean, I basically do accounting during the day, and then I'm usually up in the middle of the night doing writing. So I'm, I'm basically bringing the candles to both ends. Oh, very interesting. Uh, and uh, what about the, the sales of your book? You have a, a real publisher and all that. I mean, most of us, the rest of us uh, publish our own stuff, but. Um, I've got a, the publishing that I have is a very small publishing uh, company out of Michigan. They don't really, pick up a lot of my publishing costs. Um, they, they help me with the designs and they help me with some of the distribution and the editing. Uh, but for the most part, I mean, they're not a really good publishing house. And basically, to be quite honest, I, I'm, I'm more interested in, in, in publishing my books because I just enjoy writing so much. It's not that I'm looking to, to make a lot of money or to, to sell a lot of books or to get my name out there, it's just, I, I really look forward to writing. I mean, I get up every morning at two, three o'clock in the morning and I, I start writing till about five or six or seven. And um, those four or five hours early in the morning just fly by. I've got these storylines that just, you know, come into my head that, um, I, that I can't seem to get them out until I put them on paper. And I, I just really, really enjoy you know, my writing and uh, the storylines that I can put together. So it, it hasn't been so much about book sales, although, you know, it's nice to get my name out there, but it's more or less the fact that I just truly love what I'm doing. I, I, I love being an accountant and I also love being an author. So I've been lucky enough to find two passions that I really enjoy. Uh, now, do you type your uh, 
uh, writings on a computer or do you yes, write them yes, yes, I, I, I type everything. I type everything in Word and format it and, you know, do what I need to do to get it ready to, for review and editing and send that off and uh, when I'm off, we'll get on the next story. How do you create a thriller? Uh, starts off with not being able to sleep at night. <laughs> um, I think if I started getting a good night's sleep, I think my writing career would be over. Um, I, it starts out with just having a lot of bad dreams and a lot of a lot of uh, storylines that just uh, appear out of nowhere. For me. I mean, it's, I, I've been able to, uh, you know, put a lot of storylines together based on other books that I've read in years past, personal experiences in, uh, in business, uh, various media things that are going on. Uh, like uh, when a book takes the queen is a perfect example. That's all inspired from all the events that occurred in Chicago last summer. Yeah. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, a lot of different things that, uh, that, that are just I've experienced in, in my life. And um, I, for some odd reason, I don't have a shortage of storylines. I've got two books in, in the works now, and I'm thinking about, you know, two more storylines after that. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot to write about. Yeah, well, if, if uh, you rip things from the headlines, uh, I guess you can look forward to a, a lot of different story suggestions, and uh, I. Well, that's I, that's I, the first book that I that I've actually used as a political thriller where I've ripped the, the headline, mm -hmm. um, and I and I just basically that whole thing just got started out with just a lot of the disturbing things that were occurring in Chicago and, and the rioting and the looting and uh, the Black Lives Matter movements and the uh, ripping down of the Columbus statue and so forth. I mean, there were just a lot of things and a lot of disturbing events that occurred last summer that, that, that inspired me to write that book. Uh, well, yeah. Normally I don't, I don't turn on the six o'clock news and look right here to write. Now, are there any uh, writers that you have read who have uh, had an impact on you? Um, I've, uh, I've read a few books on Grisham um, years ago, but to be quite honest with you, I've probably been more interested in developing my own style, and I really didn't want to familiarize myself with the way other people write their novels or write their their headlines. And uh, it, it's I, I I read a tremendous amount of books when I was in high school and college. I did a lot of reading uh, afterward, but uh, most lately I, I'm doing more writing than I am reading. And I learned to develop my own style that way. And I thankfully had, you know, um, to the point to where I've got it to where I can develop a, a decent storyline and a decent book. Uh, yes. Um, uh, Anything, uh, tell us a little bit about the, uh, the Vatican uh, novel. Uh, as you know, about uh, 40 years ago, 45 years ago, when Pope John Paul I was discovered uh, dead in his sleep after 33 days being the pontiff of the Vatican, there were a lot of rumors that were floating around Rome that basically suggested that Pope John Paul I was poisoned. Um, that rumor has been rampant in uh, in Rome for the last 40 years. And I just remember reading something to the effect of a cardinal who suggested that he may have been responsible for poisoning Pope John Paul I. And that's how that story went. So I, I basically picked up those two issues and decided to see where that storyline would go. That was probably my longest duration of writing as far as my novel goes. It was my first novel of Bread and Wine. It took me almost two years to complete that. But um, after doing a lot of research and doing a lot of reading on the Vatican and, and 
with John Paul I and studying the various cardinals that were involved in the Vatican right Curia, that uh, inspired me to put that uh, book together. It's, and it's uh, gotten great reviews. Did you hang on, uh, hang out at the Vatican? Uh, did you to get a sense of place? I've been to the Vatican several times. I've been to Italy several times. And uh, th those experiences sort of helped me formulate the storyline. So I was, it was a lot that I could draw on. Uh -huh. Well, you talked about reviews. Uh, uh, where have your books been reviewed? Uh, Titan Review has been a good one. Kirkus Reviews. Uh, Daily Herald has uh, given us a, given me a review on one of my books. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Kirkus. You name it. Online Reviews. There's, there's about 10 or 12 different review services that have yeah. given, you know, given a four and five star reviews on some of my, uh, some of my novels. Yeah, well, Kirkus is important to, for uh, yes. uh, libraries. The librarians decide whether to order books based uh, somewhat on Kirkus. So that's uh, that, that's good news for uh, for you and your uh, and, and so you you say you have uh, uh, books in in mind uh, for the future. Uh, can you give us a little hint of <laughs> what they might concern? Um, yeah, uh, the book I'm currently working on now is a, uh, the title is They Only Wear Black Cats, and that is about a frustrated um, Detroit detective who, uh, you know, works hard to collar a criminal who committed a, uh, a heinous crime against two little children, and, uh, finds out that these, the, the killer, because there was no real evidence against him, was basically set free. And um, throughout his own personal investigations, he finds out that there is a society that gets together um, once every three months, and it consists of judges, politicians, uh, local statesmen, and so forth, that uh, get together and they plan revenge uh, assassinations against those killers that get off you know, for murder. And um, that's how that book starts out. It's set in the city of Detroit. Um, I named it the Malizia Society. And, Malizia uh, Society. The Malizia Society, which is basically a society of malice. And uh, I did some research on that and found out that there was such a society, although they didn't use that name back in Florence in 1539, which uh, basically stated that there were uh, people that did get together to uh, plan revenge on those killers who uh, were let off by uh, the judicial system. There's also, a, there's also a movie that was put out um, about 30 years ago called The Star Chamber. And uh, there's something with a similar plot line to that. And that's based on a chamber of judges that got together back in England, uh, back in the 18th century, who you know planned to uh, take revenge against these uh, various uh, various criminals who got away with uh, got away from the judicial who felt they were trapped. Have you had any nibbles from uh, media makers or from the filmmakers or TV? No, not yet. I put together a couple of uh, scripts for my first and second book, and um, just still trying to pedal those out right now. Um, I, I think my problem is, is, I, is I'm, I'm kind of splitting myself between my accounting career and my writing career, and I think if I put more time into doing more marketing and more solicitations as far as my uh, books and my writings are concerned, I probably would have even more of a positive result. But so far, I'm, I'm happy with where I'm at right now. So I'm, I'm eventually thinking that uh, someone will discover or pick up or look at my books or look at my uh, scripts and decide to run with them. But we'll see. Um, Time will tell. Uh, are, uh, how much of your writing is autobiographical or? Uh, 
I think you have to ask my mother that question. Um, she thinks it's all about autobiographical, so I don't know. Um, there, there's probably a little bit of me in all of my characters. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've had people read my books and say that my DNA is written all over. So that could be. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of me and all the protagonists and maybe even some of the antagonists in the book. Well, in, in a sense, we can see uh, that uh, Italian American writers or all writers uh, uh, record their own history in their writings. And uh, that uh, in itself is a service uh, to saving our stories, uh, plus uh, telling a good story is uh, always a, a big plus too. Uh, we're gonna throw it open uh, to the audience here to ask for questions. And if, if you have a question, unmute yourself and, uh, and go ahead with it. Here are my questions for Ed. How much autobiography do you put in your novel? Well, I think we have to be answered that. Okay. Where is Izzy's is family from? Are you still from that club? Okay. Um, my family is from the Lazio area. My mother was born in Rome and my father is born in a little town near Rome. It's called Monte, Monte Cassino. It's called Casavieri, which is uh, right in the Lazio area. And, uh, that's where my mother and father were both born. And uh, I've been there several times. And um, there's a lot of Italian culture that I've learned from that area. Uh, we asked a question from uh, Professor Carla Simonini. Hi, Carla. Hi, Carla. Hi, Ed. Oh, How are I, get, you? I hear feedback when I talk. I don't like that. Um, I just want to give a shout out to how wonderful your works are. I've got my copy here oh. of, uh, of the, the, divine, the Demons of Divine Wrath. So I've read that one and I read the first one too. So oh, thank um, you. I, I want to, uh, your ability to create a storyline and draw your reader in and the complexities of your plot um, especially with the, the, the demons of the divine wrath. I just, I found that so uh, compelling. I mean, it really makes, Thank I mean, I, I think it's very cinematic too. I could see how this would make a fascinating film. So I'm hoping that you really do get, is this one of the works that you have? Uh, no, I, I did the first two. I did the bread and wine and I did the rose from the execution. I did mm -hmm. the, the scripts for those. Mm -hmm. And I'm slowly finding the time to uh, do the scripts for the other, but they're very time consuming. I find I find script writing more complicated and more difficult than writing the actual book. Well, yeah, I think it's you have to be able to visualize what's, how it's going to translate to screen. And it's not the same as writing everything out from an omniscient perspective yeah, with the characters. Yeah. I can imagine that. So Yeah, well, not only that, it's, you're doing a lot of condensing. Mm -hmm. and you're just basically concentrating on dialogue, setting the, the, uh, setting the area of how the, uh, how the storyline will go and it's very mm -hmm. difficult to uh to do all that and put it into a script and then condense it and keep it down to 120 pages because as, as i came to find out every one page in a script equals one minute on film so i mean you don't want to sit through or two or more than like two two or two and a half hour film so basically yeah. you can you're condensing and putting everything down to 120 to 150 pages so that's complicated i find that very complicated when you start writing that yeah, well, I can only imagine. Um, well, my question actually, well, aside from giving the shout out to everybody to, to read these books and how, how I've shared them with my father, my father loves thrillers oh, and he, he, he has thank enjoyed you. them too. So just want to put that out there. The other thing is um, you talked about your family maybe not really encouraging you to go into writing, which is a common theme when you study any Italian American author, even the ones like Puzo himself, I remember he he was told that you know he'd be a chooch, you know, when his first <laughs> novel didn't have success, and it was only years later with The Godfather that he redeemed himself supposedly in the eyes of his family for at least for being able to provide financially. But the other thing that goes along with that, at least in traditional Italian society, is this idea that. Um, you don't want to reveal too much about yourself and you don't want to write about your own family and put your dirty laundry out there. And that was another thing that this sense of like confessional type writing, which is uh, 
what we're so used to in, in, in literature uh, didn't jibe with what it meant to follow Italian American cultural norms. So I don't know if, I mean, I, you say you find yourself in some of your characters, but I, 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 I don't see that, at least in the, what I've read, that you're like delving into like the nuances of growing up in your family or anything like that. I was just wondering if that tendency was still alive in your family, that you don't write about and put things out in public that should be kept like well, the family. There, you know, I, I'm glad you brought that up, Carla. There, there's a book that I've been working on that's I started about two and a half years ago, and um, I've had I've had difficulty finishing. And it's not a, a crime thriller by any means. Um, I, I'll give you a little synopsis. It's about five little boys who grow up in a suburb who uh, are from abused families, and um, these abused families and their abused fathers have, you know, taken liberties with them with some of these children who. Uh, grow up to be adults and uh, they all become dysfunctional one by one by one. They have a difficult time going through life. Some become alcoholics, some become drug addicts, mm -hmm. some become violent with their own families, uh, some end their own lives. And uh, there's some personal experiences in some of those plot lines there in that particular uh, title that, that I've had trouble writing. So I, I find that when you're writing a thriller, especially a crime thriller, um, you're writing, you know, you're combining the first person with the third person, you're drawing experiences from your own personal life, but then you're putting together storylines that you've heard from others and you're kind of like mixing and meshing everything together. Mm. But there's a little bit of my DNA and there's a little bit of my personality and a lot of my protagonists. I've, sure. I've been told that by more than one person. Yeah. That's great. I know. I just think, um, like with Puso, his fortunate pilgrim. What a powerful, beautiful novel that is. Mm. And uh, you know, it's not the novel his family would have wanted him to have put out there. So, um, yeah, well, just that that push and pull between what it means to become a, a writer and uh, you know uh, what the culture is behind that. That would you know. I don't think traditional Italian culture has been conducive <laughs> to no, it's not. to. Uh, you know, it's to not. encouraging young writers to go in that direction. That's, yeah, so. And, and the problem that I have now, too, is, you know, my mother is 78 years old. Mm. And of course, she reads everything that I write. And every time I'm writing something, I'll finish a, a chapter. And then I'll say to myself, now, what is my mother going to say? It's, it's <laughs> always my concern. What is my mother going to think after she reads the sex scene? I was going to say, you have some racy book? scenes. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like, what is my mother going to say? What is my mother going to yeah. think? Or I'll put something in there where there's, I have little Tony, one of my characters, and, and, one, and, one, and one books, and, and little Tony is a consistent swear fiend. That's all he mm. does is use the F word. And I, I say in my novels that little Tony probably wouldn't be able to talk if he couldn't use the F word when he was talking. Every time I, I put the dialogue in there, I'm like, oh, great, my mother's going to read this. Where is she going to say? <laughs> Well, no thank you for your work, and I, you know, I'm going to keep sharing it. So. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I yeah. Really appreciate your thoughts. Mary Maturi Gibson has a comment. Mary. Yes, I just commented, uh, 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 writing there that uh, I write about my family and put all the dirty laundry out there, and people see it because they write me and tell me they have had the same experiences and some of the same things that I talk about in my books. And they're just so pleased. But I'm pleased to hear you say that um, you don't care how much money you make and, and, and you're out there to write because you have something to say. And that's a true writer. And, and you know, I salute you because that is how people should write. You write because you have something to say, not that you're gonna become rich and famous, you have something to say and somebody else will see it and appreciate it. And that is what, that's what makes it, makes it so wonderful. Well, it, it's the joy of enjoying what you do. And it's, yeah. It's a joy of, of, of putting it on paper and, and constructing a plot and mm -hmm. putting together the nuances of a particular personality for a particular character. And mm -hmm. it, it's, it's really enjoyable. I mean, I, it is. 
I'm, no, I'm my I, fourth book. I can't sleep at night. I, I'll get up in the middle of the night and start you writing. When you write stuff in the middle of the night, <laughs> I do yeah, that definitely. all the time. <laughs> definitely. I, I, I tell people that if I ever get a good night's sleep, my writing career will be over. Right, right. Just a hint. I work with Stratton Press. I love them. I think they're very good. Look into Stratton Press. They're very good. They've been very good to me. I, I, I can't say enough about them. Oh, okay. their, their prices are reasonable. You know, they help you out. They really do. They do your marketing. They do everything. And they wow. charge you very minimal fees. Very minimal. Uh, Tony Artizoni is out there in uh, the West Coast. Yeah, thank you. It's wonderful. Uh, I'm delighted by this conversation. And it's uh, a pleasure to meet you and get to know your work. I have to confess yeah. that... Um, just I, this is the first time I've really heard of you when Dominic sent the uh, the message that you would be talking. But I've got your books on order. Oh, and really great! Over yeah. the next months, the next weeks and months. Uh, to so uh, if you do lose some sleep reading them, I'm, I'm not advisable. <laughs> I will. I probably well. I'll I'll do my best. Um, okay. I really enjoyed your your talk about about how much pleasure you take and the idea that the reward is the work itself. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I think that that defines anyone's character when they can really look at doing something that they really truly enjoy and that they, you know, the mm -hmm. bottom line and the checkbook and what goes into it is secondary. We should get one of your you really enjoy it. It's like my accounting profession. I mean, we, you know, we pay our bills being accountants, but yeah. basically, I've always said that accounting is a people profession. You want to be able to help people with their businesses or with their personal finances. Right. The satisfaction of doing that is worth a lot more than whatever check they write you at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be able to find something that you truly enjoy. And uh, you look forward to, to doing it on a daily basis. I also envy you. Um, oh, thank you. I, I don't know why, but thanks. The fact that you could write for more than more than just uh, two hours or three hours, and the apparent ease that uh, that what? you have, uh, God, I think a lot of writers spend some time just looking at that blank page, not not knowing quite where to advance. Is this something that has to do, perhaps, with the genre? I mean, do you? I guess I'm asking, do you plot? scenes ahead so do you know where it's going or do you discover as you go along or a combination of both if i told you how i sat down to write a book you would probably have me locked up okay. i would what you would probably have me locked up you would think <laughs> no 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 i actually come up with the title okay i find the title for it. i find an interesting title and then i put together a plot line that would go good with the title and from the title i designed the characters and uh, I always try to start with a very shocking scene in the beginning of the book. And that's always written in third person. And then from there, I'll do a first, a first person, second chapter. And I try to keep all my chapters roughly about 2,000 words a piece. Uh, this way it keeps the, 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 the uh, plot and the pace of the story going. And it allows you to switch back and forth between the first and the third person and going from scene to scene and keeping the, uh, the pace of the book going. And I think that's really essential in a, uh, in a thriller fiction novel. You want to keep that action going. You don't want to write these long chapters with four and 5,000 words that tend to, you know, put a wall into the, uh, into the, uh, into the plot line. So I, 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 that's the style that I've developed. I, I, that's really what's worked for me. Um, plus, I, I've, I've got this um, this habit of ending all my chapters with one sentence, um, and that one sentence sort of pulls you into the next chapter. Yeah, I've always enjoyed doing that. I think that works. That is fantastic. So you've developed your own work method and your own style. Um, boy, I. Can't wait for these books to arrive. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll you'll see. There's 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 a there's a similarity in all the chapters, and um, each book has between forty to forty five chapters. I think one book's got fifty chapters. Um, 
but they're all short chapters. And when you read short chapters, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of falling into the pace. That's what keeps you involved in the plot. Um, I've read some books where you've got, you know, a book with 15 chapters of uh, you know, five to seven to 10,000 words a piece. And I don't think that works in a, in, in a thriller fiction novel. It might work in some other things, but for a thriller fiction novel, I don't think it would. Uh, we have Michael Harrington has a question. Yes, uh, Hi, Michael. I was just uh, I was I was just interested. We were looking uh, at your books before the the call, and I noticed that you have a different protagonist in each book instead of you know like Dan Brown did bringing back the same person. Right. Right. Why is that? I think all. Um, this is just my personal opinion. I. I'm not in love with uh, sequels. Uh, I, I like to, to, to do a strong book with a strong protagonist. And then what I always do in my subsequent books is I'll bring the protagonist of one book taking a minor role in the next story. But all my books are standalones. And I think they should be that way. Because if you want to read one book, I don't think a reader should have to go back and start from the very beginning to read all the other books that were you know, that were affiliated with that storyline for the third or the fourth one. All my books are, st are standalones, and I think uh, that's what makes my books, I think, a little bit more popular. That you, can, you can pick up, uh, you know, when a, uh, when a Rook Takes the Queen, or you can pick up Quendo Dormo, and they're completely different books, they're completely different storylines, and either one is not going to ruin the, uh, the storyline of the other. So I think that's, uh, I think that's something that I think it's what, what's, what makes you know my thriller fiction now is a little bit more a little bit more appealing. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions out there, uh, Jeanette? Yeah, I um, every but. Um, Ed spoke at one of our authors' conferences some years ago, and I think you only had two books in the can at that point, and I read both of them, and I couldn't wait to get to the end because it was they were real page turners and pretty bloody too, but Thank still you. they were good. They Thank were you. good, and now I see that I'm uh, way behind now, so I need to get to read the other ones. Well, you can but, start. You uh, can start anywhere tonight. You don't have to start from the beginning. Yeah, I know. I, I understand. They're all standalone, so that's great. I like that and. Uh, I wanted to say, uh, make a comment uh, also on family business going into books. Uh, we had an incident in our family where the cousins were all excited because they heard a family story and they were going to put it on Facebook. <laughs> it's, it's one thing to put it in a book with pseudonyms or other names or just part characters, but not to put it on Facebook. So I had to make a phone call <laughs> and advise not to put this on Facebook. It's not that it was so awful. It just was not complimentary and uh, it would cause some hurt to some people in the family. So it was not wise to reveal this thing, especially on a medium uh, like Facebook. So, uh, you know, I, I say you have to be careful, especially if your mommy or daddy's gonna read it and be scandalized. Some cousins will be hurt that they don't know all the story. So sometimes it is better to be a little more prudent. But anyway, I'm backed up on your books, uh, Edward. So I'll need to read the rest of them, see how they're going. Oh, but, thank uh, you. I won't I, get let, any let sleep know what either. No sleep Thoughts. at all because I read at night. <laughs> good job. Very good job. Thank you. But, well, to go back to what you said, um, I'm, uh, I'm always worried about what my mother's doing. She makes sure that she reads all my books, so I've got to be careful. But um, there's uh, there, there's a certain distance that you can take some family experiences when you do write a book, you know, if it's fictional and all of it's uh, uh, dirty. Okay, and anybody else have a, a question or comment that they'd like to make at this point? Okay. Uh, well. Uh, Ed, I want to ask you to uh, uh, sort of summarize uh, your uh, presentation today in 25 words or less. That's going to be hard. <laughs> uh, um, about the 
25. I'm not counting. <laughs> I I think if I could summarize anything that we've talked about, just find find whatever your passion is, even if it's writing or painting or um, whatever is out there that you really enjoy doing, and just go forward with it and, and know that you're going to find a, a tremendous amount of satisfaction with what you put out there. And uh, that's that's my goal. I mean, I if I only write a couple more books, or if I can write two dozen more books, to know that. One single person out there enjoyed what I put on paper and what I enjoyed putting on print. That that means the world to me, and I hope every other writer can go out and take that attitude someday as well. Well, uh, thank you very much, Ed, and uh, you. I enjoyed this round thank of you. applause for your presentation, and thank a you. note that this will be on. Uh,